From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And coming up today, plenty for you cow-calf producers, starting with K-State's Justin Wagner, discussing using forage analysis information, linking the numbers from such an analysis to cow and heifer nutritional needs, Following then, K-State's Bob Weber, looking ahead to the series of K-State Winter Ranch Management Meetings set for the first half of February. Bob will talk about what these sessions will cover in the areas of cow and heifer selection, mineral supplementation, cow herd facilities upgrades, and herd reproduction economics. Later this week's K-State Horticulture segment, Greg Eyestone talks about starting onion transplants from seed. All this and more here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Our guest now has been in previous broadcasts and continues to do so today, tooting the horn, if you will, of the value of forage analysis for you cow-calf producers to consider as you're working through your forage supplies during the fall and now winter months. And joining us once more is Research and Extension Beef Systems Specialist for K-State, based in southwest Kansas, Justin Wagner. Before we get into particulars here of those forage analysis reports and what they truly indicate to the producer, Justin, the, the basic purpose of analyzing forages, you'd like to see more producers take this measure. Why so? Well, I think one of the things about, about forage testing is you know, first off, I think I think a lot of producers don't necessarily understand, you know, what it can do for them or, or what those numbers mean. We we submit that sample, we get a sheet back that's got some, some four numbers on it that may or may not be entirely meaningful to us. And so, you know, it's something that is maybe viewed that doesn't have a whole lot of practical application. And and however, you know, I would contend the fundamental reason um, that we evaluate forages is really it, it's about improving our ability to meet the animal's nutrient requirements and and to give us a better estimates of animal performance when we utilize those feedstuffs or those forages. And so really, forage analysis is, really has a tremendous practical application if if we apply it. And one is wanting to, by the same token, manage that hay inventory in the most economical way while not compromising the condition or the performance of the herd. So that's what you're trying to arrive at, basically, with this information in hand, right? Yeah, that's one of the, the very basic things that we can do if we have um, some numbers from a forage analysis. You know, the simple analogy I use is that most cow-calf operations have access to usually two to three different types of forages that they might utilize in, in different capacities on the operation. You know, we may have a, a relatively low-quality forage, um, something in the, the neighborhood of corn stalks or CRP hay. They might have some higher-quality grass hay, say some brome, uh, and then maybe an alfalfa. And, uh, you know, determining how and when we should maybe utilize those forages in relationship to our animal nutrient requirements, you know, that's one of the things that a feed analysis can do for us. We know what the values are in those forages so we can do a better job of allocating those to the cattle and meeting their appropriate needs. All right. Well then, and we will give some general observations on what these forage analyses numbers would suggest to the producer because you can get pretty deep into the weeds as far as specific numbers are concerned here. But you're looking at generally a handful of components that might make up that forage. That's what's measured and evaluated in the analysis itself, correct? That's right. The The most essential components that, that we're really looking for uh, would be dry matter, Crude protein, ADF, and then calcium and phosphorus are also important uh, from the mineral side. Those are really the basic elements. Um, so I rely a lot on crude protein and ADF. 
crude protein, obviously we're pretty familiar with talking about protein requirements to, to cows and, and what those would be. The ADF number we may not be as familiar with, but that acid ADF or acid detergent fiber is really the number that we utilize to determine the energy content of the forage. It's linked with digestibility. And, and so we can utilize that number to uh, estimate our energy content of those forages and, and give us some indication of, you know, a lot of times it can tell us whether uh, looking at the ADF value, give us some indication of, of the forage's maturity, really without even looking at the, the forage itself physically. There are a couple of other values that frequently show up in a forage test report, the energy estimates. You might explain those. Yeah, so those, uh, the, I think what you're referring to is the net energy mm-hmm. for maintenance and net energy for gain or production, as it's sometimes referred to. And, and really, both of those numbers are going to be generated from some equations uh, that we'd utilize from the ADF number. Uh, so net energy of maintenance corresponds to the value of that particular feed or feedstuff when it's going to be utilized for maintenance purposes. So the animals at maintenance, there is no net production gain from that. The reason that we break those out into a maintenance and production function is simply that energy is utilized more efficiently when an animal is at maintenance relative to when that energy is going to be utilized for productive purposes such as putting on animal gain or lactation. There are different efficiencies, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so we've just partitioned that out in our effort in terms of feedstuff analysis to make our numbers do a better job of actually predicting animal performance. So you have, as a producer, this information in hand for all of these values from your forage analysis. Putting it all together and, more importantly, comparing what those numbers tell us to what the cow's nutrient requirements are. And how does one easily go about that, Justin? Well, so, you know, there's there's two things, and, and you kind of alluded to it. You know, we need some numbers on the forages, you know, first of all, that, that were the feedstuffs that we have available to us. You know, the second component that we need to be able to do that is we have to have some sort of reasonable approximation of what the animal's needs are or the animal's requirements. You know, my example of using forage analysis to manage a forage inventory, we can use crude protein content of the forages and the animal requirements to do that. So if we take, for example, you know, general rule of thumb that I use is 7, 9, 11. So the dietary crude protein requirements of a dry pregnant cow can be met by a diet that would contain approximately 7% crude protein. She moves into the third trimester, we need to have a diet that's about 9% crude protein. And then, you know, once we've calved and we now have a lactating cow, it's probably closer to 10 or 11. So now that we kind of know what our animal side is, then we can take a look at our forages. And so if we've got, you know, forages that are going to range, if we've used our, you know, analysis that might range from 4% crude protein, all the way up to 16 or 17 percent crude protein that might be an alfalfa. Then we can take different amounts of those forages and begin to blend those together and and meet the requirements of those cows. Uh, so, for example, if we have that low quality forage that's you know four to five percent crude protein, and we're feeding that to that third trimester cow that has a requirement for crude protein to be somewhere in the range of nine percent, we're obviously going to have to put a little bit of that higher quality, maybe that sixteen to seventeen percent crude protein forage with that Mm -hmm. to be able to meet that cow's nutrient requirements. And so you can do a lot better job of matching our animal needs uh, versus the supply that's coming from those forages. Point is that one can put together any number of combinations here of various forages, and it would be worth a producer's while from the economic efficiency standpoint as well as the nutrient standpoint for the herd, making sure that one's not overfeeding or underfeeding then, right? Yes, that's absolutely correct. You know, the other big thing that, that I think is really out there is we we have typically have very different quantities of those feedstuffs. We may have a, a forage that we have quite a lot of. We may have something else that uh, we may not have near as much of, so we may need to utilize that as a supplement and try to, to really target how we use that, that feedstuff that might be of, uh, that we don't have as great a supply of. So, again, the encouragement here is to the cow-calf producer, uh, utilize this forage analysis. And if one needs more guidance, they can uh, work with various nutritionists uh, and others to help sort out the information, right? 
That is absolutely correct. It only becomes a tool when you use it. There, by the way, is a new article in the Beef Tips newsletter put out by K-State Research and Extension. Justin authored it, and it talks about how we can use the numbers from a forage analysis in cow-calf nutrition management. It's a good read with some examples of how you mix and match those forages and evaluate the values that might be resulting from that forage analysis. Go to ksubeef.org for a look at that write-up. But it's something, producers, that if you've not put much stock in in the past, you might well consider currently, and that is utilizing forage analysis in your routine management. Justin, we appreciate the input. Thank you. Thanks. He's Justin Wagner, Beef Systems Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. And very much on a related note, we'd pass this along to you once more. K-State's Analytical Laboratory in the Animal Sciences and Industry Department has just announced that it is expanding its services and will now analyze forage samples to give you producers a, a clearer picture of what your livestock are consuming. Katie Hargrove is the new laboratory manager. She tells us that the services have been expanded to include mineral and fiber analysis and nitrate testing. The laboratory is housed at Weber Hall here on the campus, and among the tests they're offering now, moisture and dry matter content, crude protein, calculated total digestible nutrient analyses, and more. If you'd like to learn more about this new availability... Do one of two things. You can go to the Animal Sciences and Industry website, asi.k-state.edu, or you can contact K-State's Katie Hardgrove directly at 785-532-1276. Once more, that's 785-532-1276, or email her at khargrove at ksu.edu. We'll be back shortly. This is Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. And profiled during this segment, one more opportunity for you cow-calf producers to sharpen your management skills and learn how to contend with contemporary challenges in cow-calf production. K-State will be putting on, once again, a series of winter ranch management meetings around Kansas. These have proven over the recent years to be well worth your while, producers. Joining us now is cow-calf production specialist. Specialist Bob Weber, K-State Research and Extension, among those planning these each year. And Bob, it is a successful series. We might start out with that, as past meetings have proven. Right, Eric. We've had uh, a really great run um, with our winter ranch management uh, meetings over the last few years. We've changed formats uh, a couple of times, but uh, the most recent incarnation really is uh, a set of uh, four meetings spread around the state, kind of a a fairly common program uh, across those locations. But we want to kind of get some timely information in the hands of uh, our uh, cow-calf producers around the state. And uh, we've had uh, great attendance at these meetings over time and think we've got a a great lineup uh, slated for our 2018 series. These are coming up the first half of February, well distributed throughout the state, as you note. Your select theme this year, Management and Profit Strategies for 2018, straightforwardly enough. Yep. So we, uh, uh, our beef extension team uh, got together last fall and kind of worked through with our uh, local and district agents around the state and kind of did a little survey, if you will, of, uh, of topics everybody thought uh, would be really important for our producers in, in 2018. 
convene and, and assemble the, a, a program um, that uh, or surrounds the ideas of corrals, uh, calcium or mineral supplementation strategies, costs of production, um, and certainly cows and cow management. And each of your speakers at these sessions will take on one of those key topics. We'll repeat the dates and locations, but to give them out right here, February the 6th in Beloit, the 7th in Oldsburg, the 8th in Dighton, and the 13th in Hepler in southeast Kansas. You'll have one of your colleagues talking about facilities improvements that the cow cow producer might consider. That's right. Um, Our team, uh, a number of them uh, collaborated to put together a new uh, extension fact sheet focused on some facilities improvement ideas. Um, So Dr. Justin Wagner, uh, who's based uh, in, in southwest uh, Kansas. Um, we'll talk about facilities improvements uh, and bud box cattle processing systems. We've had a lot of interest in those, both um, from a, a usability perspective, but certainly um, some of the lower cost kind of uh, improvements that work really, really well for cattle handling. In fact, our new uh, purebred beef unit facilities here at, uh, at K-State, both of those facilities incorporate bud box facilities. And uh, I probably checked about 100 cows through them here a couple of weeks ago. And uh, that was the the first uh, large animals through, and they worked fantastic. So um, we've got some great great information to share um, in person. And Dr. Wagner's uh, one of our resident experts, if you will, on sort of cattle behavior and cattle handling. And so he'll be uh, he'll be covering uh, those facility ideas. And another colleague will talk of mineral supplementation strategies, as you note. Right. At at, at three spots, uh, uh, Dr. Jamie Lynn Farney, one of the ruminant nutritionists in our group, um, will talk about uh, mineral supplementation strategies for uh, cow-calf producers. We get a lot of questions uh, uh, over time uh, about mineral supplementation. Um, And certainly I know there's uh, there's some issues going on right now and availability of uh, uh, a couple of different vitamin products um, that are commonly used in, in cattle mineral and and have some implications to the cost structure of those products. Uh, Dr. Farney will be uh, uh, speaking at um, all the locations except for Hepler. We had some specific interest for a a meeting and topic in Hepler that's uh, not at the other ones, but um, Dr. Farney will cover mineral at uh, Beloit, Oldsburg, and Dighton. Since you brought it up, let's mention the uh, substitute presentation at Hepler. This is going to get into an approach to Cerecia lespedisa control that's garnered more than a fair amount of attention. Lately, right. right. So one of our uh, talented colleagues here in the department, uh, Dr. Casey Olson, and many of you out in the, in the listening audience will know uh, or have heard of Dr. Olson, and he's conducted some research over the last few years around the idea of late season burning as a method to control cerise and had some really um, outstanding uh, results from that work. Um, and of course, uh, Southeast Kansas is an area of, of our state that faces some substantial challenges. And in fact, some of the research for this project was done um, in Southeast, and so a lot of interest in that region for that particular topic. And so uh, Dr. Olson will join us for the, the late season burn talk. Again, at the Hepler site. At the Hepler site. location, right. Now, your associate, Sandy Johnson, will be taking on that economic side, and and a production benchmarking will be her topic of choice. Right. So uh, Dr. Uh, Johnson uh, uh, writes the, the beef tips column, and uh, routinely in that uh, uh, publication, there's a, a column called Tally Time, mm-hmm. and uh, really focused around the idea of, uh, of practical production records and profit indicators that cow-calf producers should track over time in their operations. And uh, given some of the, the changes we've observed, uh, uh, both in the cost structure on, on the cow-calf production system, but certainly changes in, in the revenue streams, we've seen uh, uh, producers have more interest in, in we're encouraging some more focus on um, some of those profit indicating values. So doing a better job of, of some simple managerial record keeping to uh, help inform some production decisions. We think, uh, you know, over the next uh, two to three years, things will tighten up substantially on the cow-calf side. Um, We've seen some of that already through uh, the fall of 2017. Um, And so we want to kind of help prepare our producers to think uh, about some of those metrics to help uh, make some management decisions focused on profit. Lastly, you will be, Bob, at each of these sites as well, and you are going to take a closer look at cow and heifer selection. What are you going to drum upon there? Yeah, I'll, I'll be talking about kind of optimization of our, our cow herd. The talk really is going to focus around um, both some of the, the genetic aspects of selection that uh, help set up uh, females for success and longevity in our cow herd. And for those of you out in the listening world know I'm, I'm kind of a, a geneticist by training, really, 
Um, and so the second part of this talk actually uh, pains me a little bit, and it's um, really looking at some of the phenotypic characteristics we know um, that really make females have a higher likelihood of success in the production system. And so that's a little tongue-in-cheek. I think both components are ones that we need to focus on in our cow and heifer selection strategies to really put together a, a female that has the highest likelihood uh, or best chances of being successful in the long run in our herd um, reproductively. And so some of those other attributes besides the genetic pieces are, you know, where, where that heifer was uh, in, in the calving season, where was she born? Um, we know from a number of research trials that heifers that are born at the beginning of the calving season under a defined management system have much higher likelihood of success and longevity than the heifers born in the last, say, 21-day period of a, of a calving distribution. Um, and so some real practical things like that that help point us to um, replacement females that are the best bets to go into our replacement pen. It's a big puzzle to piece together in as it far really as is. female selection. And what, what we want to try and do is, is boil it down to the sort of the bare essentials because we know as – you add more complexity to the decision-making stream, the more opportunity and more risk there is in that decision stream. Um, and so we want to get kind of everybody focused on the, as our, our former colleague Chris Reinhardt would say, the big rocks, right? We want to make sure we got the big rocks um, sorted into the jar first so that we get uh, get them covered. Very well. Here we are pushing into the middle part of January, so registration for any of these will likely be due fairly soon, will it not, Bob? That's right. All these events will have their evening events, typically registration about 530, and the program and, and dinner event will start about 6. Please RSVP to the respective locations uh, a week in advance of the program, so they've got time to get their uh, uh, catering and, and meal prep stuff sorted out. So a week in advance would be uh, really appreciated. If you're planning to go to the Beloit meeting, you can uh, uh, RSVP to uh, uh, Barrett Simon in the Post Rock District office, uh, Caitlin Brockus at River Valley, uh, or Clint Laughlin. Uh, he's the new uh, uh, district agent in the Midway District. For Oldsburg, that meeting's on, uh, on February 7th, so if you'd RSVP January 31 to uh, the Pot County Extension office, uh, Shannon Blocker's uh, our county agent there in Pot County. Um, she's assisted by Greg McClure in Riley County and Anastasia Johnson and Marshall County are the three that are hosting our Oldsburg location. In Dighton, please send that uh, RSVP to uh, Jared Petersley. Um, and Jared's in uh, the Walnut Creek office. If you'd send that by February 1, that'd be outstanding. The last location uh, in Hepler, Chris Petty uh, in Southwind District and Keith Martin at Wildcat are the two hosts for that location. Um, that meeting's February 13. So if you'd RSVP by February 6, we'd be deeply appreciative. Excellent. There will be information on this series as well, posted quite soon on the ksubeef.org website, so be looking for that. But, Bob, in closing, CalCap producers, a great opportunity to pick up on many a thing that hopefully will help them as they push their way through this new year. Yeah, we're uh, we're really excited about the program. It's kind of varied in, in topics, so we think there'll be a, a pretty broad set of interests that we can get covered and uh, sure encourage folks to come out. Um, we look forward to interacting with you at uh, our Winter Ranch Management Series. A great series it is, and thanks for the look ahead to it. We appreciate it, Bob. Great. Thank you, Eric. He's a cow-calf specialist. K-State Research and Extension is Bob Weber. The 2018 Winter Ranch Management Meetings, again as follows, February 6th in Beloit, the 7th in Oldsburg, February 8th in Dighton, February 13th in Hepler. Contact the Extension personnel in those locales to find out more or to register. Or again, ksubeef.org has further information for you likewise on this exceptional series that's coming up soon. And you're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants.
Coming to you from the campus of Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Welcome back. For you now, today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. Well, Canada is challenging the Trump administration's use of tariffs in a complaint filed with the World Trade Organization. This just weeks before the crucial talks on revamping the North American Free Trade Agreement. Those getting underway in Montreal soon. Canada says this complaint, which was made public yesterday, is part of broader litigation to defend that country's softwood lumber producers, which were hit last year with U.S. tariffs of 20 percent or more. This complaint alleges the U.S. application of tariffs and their calculation are inconsistent with WTO obligations. Trade law experts say Canada's WTO filing is among the broadest challenges to date against the U.S. practice of imposing countervailing and anti-dumping tariffs against imports it deems to be hurting U.S. industries. U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer criticized Canada's complaint as, in his words, ill-advised and unfounded, adding that the move, quoting again here, could only lower U.S. confidence that Canada is committed to mutually beneficial trade. Now, while softwood trade not a subject being addressed in the NAFTA talks, some trade watchers say this complaint, nonetheless, will add tension around the discussions when they resume later this month in Montreal. Canadian officials have said some of the charges or changes, rather, that the Trump administration wants in NAFTA are wholly unworkable, most notably on the auto production side and how disputes are resolved among the NAFTA partners there. At the same time, Canadian officials have worked behind the scenes to press their agenda in meetings with members of Congress, state lawmakers, and business groups in hopes that influential allies across the U.S. will support keeping NAFTA in place. A report published yesterday from the Reuters news agency said that Canadian officials are increasingly convinced that the president will withdraw the U.S. from NAFTA after the conclusion of the Montreal Round, though the White House later said there has been no change in Mr. Trump's position. Chad Bone, a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics at Washington, says that Canada's complaint could be viewed as laying the groundwork for trade with the U.S. should NAFTA be terminated. To remind, USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue says he doesn't believe that the president will walk away from NAFTA. He notes that just in case the agency is making contingency plans if the trade agreement is scrapped. That sixth round of discussions will take place January the 23rd through the 28th in Montreal. The three countries have agreed to host joint negotiations through the month of March. Among the half dozen or so new reports that the USDA will issue this week will be a report on actual winter wheat seedings. That coming out tomorrow and with a look, the USDA's Gary Crawford. Coming up Friday, a huge crop report day at USDA with its trued up report on last season's crop production, a quarterly stocks report, and one more. A lot of folks will be paying attention to winter wheat seedings. In USDA's Outlook, Board Chairman Seth Meyer says there are some reasons for interest in that. We were down to... More than a 100-year low on wheat area last year. There'll be a lot of folks looking around and seeing what winter wheat seedings look like because we've had dryness in a lot of winter wheat seeded areas. You know, people concerned about emergence. Then on top of that, we had some very cold temperatures, you know, approaching negative 5 to negative 10 uh, Fahrenheit with no snow cover in a lot of those areas. So getting a better handle on seedings will at least help the market get a little better handle on what to expect from the sweet crop, which has been under extreme stress in parts of the central and southern plains. All of the USDA reports we mentioned will be released this Friday noon Eastern Time. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. And language added to the new tax law back in December to help boost farmer cooperatives could end up causing farmers to deliver their grain and other commodities largely to cooperatives at the expense of private grain companies in order to get a larger deduction on their income. The staff at the Iowa State University Center for Agricultural Law and Taxation say that they've been getting flooded with emails over the past week about the treatment and the effects of qualified cooperative dividends. In a column there, Christine Tidgren, the assistant director of the center, said that the new provision will affect farmers who market commodities through cooperatives in which they are members versus selling commodities to non-cooperatives. She says it's still too early to tell if this will be implemented. On now to the Kansas soybean update. Here's Greg Akagi. 
Kevin and Kim Coles are joining us. They are producers from Mound Ridge, Kansas. They're also part of the 34th class of the American Soybean Association DuPont Young Leaders Program. And Kevin, I'll start with you. One of the things you just did, you just completed at phase one of the Young Leader Program. Thanks to the Soybean Association for nominating us for the DuPont Young Leaders Program for this year. We had some really good experiences on our first leg of our journey here with the DuPont Young Leader Program, which was in Johnston, Iowa at the DuPont. Pioneer headquarters. Kim, being a part of this, what has that meant to you guys so far? I think the main aspect that we look forward to and like to get involved in is just being involved in the industry, the ag industry, in this case, soybeans in particular, and making sure that the U.S. soybean economy and ag economy remains strong for future generations. And this program is just a small part on leadership training and how to get involved that way, ensure that continues. Kevin, one of the things this really emphasizes is learning to communicate and influence various groups as well. Have you gotten a taste of that so far? Yeah, we have. During our training in Johnston, we had a couple of specific sessions on communication and someone on how to do it, working with the media and in terms of interviews. And I also got introduced to speaking in front of groups and kind of ways to enhance your ability to portray a message to the media. And so we had a very very good communications training from some folks that have spent years in the TV business, you know, doing interviews and, and journalism type work. We also had some training on interacting and working with people in general. Kim, one of the other exciting things about this is you get to communicate with other growers as well who are part of this Young Leaders Program. Yeah, and I think that's really a highlight of the program. And so one of our favorite things with this first phase is just meeting them, you know, young producers, seeing their operation. Each couple or individual gave a three-minute presentation on their farm and farming system, and we all have the commonality of the farming background and working in that industry, you know, seeing the different systems, Southeast U.S. versus Midwest that we're used to and their different crops and cropping systems. So that was interesting as well as just making some good friends. Kevin and Kim, I appreciate you joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. That is Kevin and Kim Coles, who are producers from Mound Ridge, Kansas. They are part of the 2018 American Soybean Association DuPont Young Leader Program, and they join us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. For you now on this part of Agriculture Today, our weekly foray into the world of horticulture. Yes, we're a long way away from the opening of the vegetable gardening season 2018. However, for those so enthused, you can get a jump on several vegetable transplants by raising those from seed right around now and through the next few weeks, depending on the vegetable. So we're told by our guest. Greg Eyestone is a horticulturist with K-State Research and Extension. He is based in Riley County, northeast Kansas. One has to make a commitment to starting vegetables from seed before they embark on this, don't they, Greg? Yeah, there's going to be some... Uh involvement on your part, uh, definitely trying to grow something indoors when it's cold outside. So that can be done and can be very enjoyable and very beneficial to maybe the body and mind when you see something green poking up here in January. That's pretty exciting for us gardeners anyway. Mm -hmm. So before we talk about the approach and what's required here, which vegetables could successfully be started from seed right around now? So we're talking about probably our cool season vegetables that we would grow. So if you want to start asparagus from seed, you can do that, although oftentimes it's a transplant or a crown that you've 
purchased, but you can start some from seed. One thing about asparagus, uh, typically we want to soak that seed coat, soften that up before we actually do the planting of that seed. The other one right now would be onion seeds. If you're wanting to start a particular variety that you can't find at your store, whether it be a a set when you come springtime planting or a bundle of plants. One thing I do is I do grow my own onions because I don't need a whole bundle of onion plants. That makes a quite a big garden <laughs> and lots to share and those things. And so I do start mine from seed, but that way I have a smaller population of transplants come springtime to put out. Just a footnote, other vegetables are to be started later on. If one's thinking tomatoes, we're well ahead of the game yes. there, for yes. example, right? Unless you're going to try and grow that indoors for quite a bit of the, the springtime season. So the next things we're looking at is probably our cold crops, broccoli, cabbage, and those will probably start around mid-February. Kind of depends on when you think that frost, the last frost is going to be of the season. And uh, those plants, of course, again, are kind of cold hardy. So a light frost isn't going to damage them. But if we get to really in the 20s, then if you had that plant out, you'd have to protect it pretty well. So there's a few things we can start now, but much more coming on down the road. Regardless, the principles we'll talk of today apply to all of those as well. What's required here? And there are some basics. And uh, it starts with uh, light, you say. Light is probably the, the most common thing that needs to be added to be a successful at this. Uh, Obviously, things aren't growing outside for temperature and light conditions. And so providing some artificial light is going to grow you a healthy plant. We have uh, lots of options nowadays. Back when I started, we were using the T12 fluorescent bulbs. They're really thick ones. Uh, Now the T8s or the T5s are readily available more energy efficient, put out much more light. So uh, that would be options you can use. And of course, nowadays, the light emitted diodes or the LED lights are being utilized quite a bit. And those are really intensive and put out a lot of energy. You can adjust the different wavelengths depending on the type of growth you're trying to accomplish. So there's lots of options out there, but you probably have to invest in something Uh, You can't just depend on the south window of your house to provide enough light. And does one have to have the capability of moving that light about, that is, to adjust that intensity? It does. Uh, We lose the light intensity the farther away the plant is from the light source. So on fluorescent bulbs, the thing we liked about them is that they don't put off a lot of heat, and so your leaves could be growing up right next against those bulbs and not damage the, the leaves and get the maximum amount of light energy possible. The LED These uh, put out much more light, and therefore you have a little more space between the leaves and the light source itself and can be successful that way. So, yeah, depending on your light source, but you do need it above the leaves. What about heat requirements, though? Whatever artificial light you're providing will supply that to an extent. Is that all that's needed here? Well, we get our best... uh, sprouting or germination from bottom heat. So when you plant your seeds, it would be good to use a heat mat, which is commercially available. Um, There's three reasons why that would be a benefit. One of the main ones is you get more of your seed to germinate, so that's good to get more seed populations going. It'll be quicker, which is just kind of a convenience to it, but also uniformity is important. So more of those seeds germinate at the same time, so if you're transplanting them out, they're all at the same stage of growth, which makes convenience uh, enjoyable. So something to think about there. And the growing medium. You're placing whatever that might be in growing flats, right? Can be. Uh, There's different ways of doing it. Some do a a seeding tray where you'll put many of your seeds in a tray, and then as those plants come to a little bit larger stage, you can transplant them out into the individual cells. may depend a little bit on the size of your seed, how you do that. The smaller seed's a little hard to get in each little cell, so sometimes those are planted kind of in bulk and let them germinate, and then you can transplant them out. But uh, there's, there's just different ways to do it, and it's, this whole thing is about having fun and experimenting and see what works best in your situation. Will regular potting soil do the trick here, or does one need to go with something a little different? Well, we, we do like the artificial medias, if you would say, not using soil. So those materials are a little bit lighter, easier for that seed to germinate through. There's no insect disease, 
fungus, those kind of things going on in those medias, so those would be beneficial. The one thing you have to do is do some fertilizing because they're not going to be loaded with lots of nutrients. But that's a little bit further down the growth stage. Getting them to germinate, all that energy comes from the seed itself, so no fertilizer is necessary at the beginning. So for quality, germination, heat, and light, and watering presumably as well. Yeah, you want to keep that seed moist until it comes up and then let it start to dry out. The one thing, we we like warm potting media to get it going, but then once the plants start to grow, we do need to cool that down. So that's one of the other things you need to think about on temperature is that you think onions growing outside, you plant them in March, what's the temperatures that they're growing in, 50, 60 degrees. And so that may be a challenge if you're doing this on your kitchen table where you have the temperature 70, 75 That's probably a little bit too warm for growing these plants. You need to cool them down, so maybe a bedroom or basement is ideal that you can have a little cooler temperature. Well, gardeners, if you'd like further guidance on the topic of starting vegetable transplants from seed and getting going with those early starts right away now, there is an article in the latest K-State Horticulture newsletter, which you can find at the Horticulture website at Kansas State University. Simply search for that and... Greg, we appreciate the overview. Thank you. Thank you. Greg Eyestone is the Riley County Extension Horticulture Agent with those thoughts on this week's K-State Horticulture segment. That brings our Thursday edition to a close. We'll be right back here this same time tomorrow and do hope that you will be likewise. Until then, Eric Atkinson here bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.